بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين Thank you everybody for joining us today uh, First of all, uh, foremost, I want to apologize for yesterday's technical difficulties uh, we, uh, we just uh, faced some issues with our uh, system yesterday and that's why we couldn't go on uh, yesterday We are glad you are joining us today uh, to talk about this very important event in our Palestinian history, the Deryasin massacre. And we are here and we're going to learn from the best and we're going to hear from one of the survivors of the massacre, of the Deryasin massacre, which happened on April 9th, 1948. So now I'm just going to go over our uh, tonight's event and how we're going to conduct it, inshallah. Let me just go. So tonight you're gonna hear from me, I'm Mu'ad Salama here from AMP Missouri, uh, the Missouri chapter. You're gonna hear from Tariq Khalil, inshallah, from AMP Chicago chapter. And also you're gonna hear from our guest, uh, Dawood Asad, the survivor of the uh, Deryasin massacre. We want to ask you a favor, please share the link with your friends and families so we can all learn about the history of our Palestine. If you have any question, after we finish the presentation, we will uh, answer all your questions. Type in your questions in uh, under the comments in the comment section. It doesn't matter which chapter you are uh, watching through. We have uh, this broadcast is going through all our chapters throughout the states. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have uh, seven different chapters are broadcasting at the same time. So if you have a question, just type it in the, in the comment and we will uh, answer it for you. This webinar will be recorded, inshallah, and we will update it to our YouTube channel. Uh, just a, This is a reminder we will have for the first time ever because of the uh, situation we are in right now, our first ever uh, online fundraising gala. And it's uh, beyond, beyond uh, quarantine Palestine, contact us. It's April 18th, live Zoom webinar. It's at 8 o'clock Eastern time, 7 o'clock Central time. So look out for that on April 18th, inshallah. We will uh, broadcast it through our, our uh, chapter pages, inshallah, on Facebook. Uh, now, let me introduce to you our uh, first speaker, uh, which is Tariq Khalil from AMP Chicago. Dara Khadir is an attorney, lecturer, and activist. He has worked with the Illinois Coalition Against Torture, an organization that seeks to end domestic police torture and raise awareness of global torture. Dara defended the civil rights of Chicago, uh, Chicagoland community as a volunteer attorney for the Council of American uh, Islamic Coalition, CARE Chicago. He is currently a board member of Education Coordinator for American Muslims of Palestine, uh, um, Chicago chapter. Uh, Dara lectures on topics such as modern Palestine history, Middle Eastern politics, and Palestine, Palestinian rights under international occupation. Uh, with that, let me turn the mic over to our brother Tariq. And Tariq, the mic is all yours. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you, Mu'ad, for that introduction. And um, thank you all for joining us for this very, very important day. Um, we're here to commemorate 72nd anniversary of the Deryasin massacre. Deryasin was an important village. It was a strategic village. It was a peaceful village. It was a village made up of approximately 700,000 Palestinians, a hundred of whom were slaughtered on that fateful day, April 9th, 1948. What I wanna do before we bring in our, uh, our brother, Ammo uh, Dehud Asad, um, who will give us a little bit more personal context, I kind of want to lay the historical context, the political context, if you will, of Dar of Dar Yassin and why it's so significant for us to commemorate this day and instill it in the Palestinian psyche so that we understand how we got to this point and how this led to the climax of our, of, of our history in the 20th century, which is the Nakba, our catastrophe. This massacre was committed by two underground terrorist gangs, by the Urgun. Now, during this time, the Urgun was led by Commander-in-Chief Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin later on became the Israeli Prime Minister in 1977. Why is that point significant? 
because even though he committed a terrorist act back in 1948, and he committed other terrorist, terrorist acts as well, this became normalized decades later, and he became the executive head of the state that was born that same year. And the other terrorist gang was the Stern Gang, or Leahy. And the leader of that gang, one of the leaders, was Yitzhak Shamir. And he also became Prime Minister of Israel. He actually succeeded Menachem Begin in 1983. So these two leaders of terrorist gangs became the executive heads of the state of Israel. So that, that point is very significant because it's almost... It's almost like whitewashing the massacre that occurred in Dariusin. Now, there is another entity that I want us to think about. The Haganah was the regular army. Um, the, the Haganah was essentially the forerunner to the, to the modern day IDF. And these two other gangs, the Urgun and Lehi or Stern Gang, they were subsumed, they were infused within the uh, modern day ID, IDF. And so all of these three groups, the Haganah, the Urgun, and the uh, Stern Gang, or Lehi, they became what, what eventually became the IDF. The Haganah, even though it was not directly involved in the massacre, they aided the, the terrorist gangs, especially the Urgun. They gave them rifles, they gave them ammunition, they gave them intelligence, they gave them equipment, and a Palmach unit. The Palmach is an elite fighting force for the Haganah. This force, of, I think around um, 17 men or so, they arrived in Dariusin that same day, a few, hours, a few hours into the massacre, and they provided ammunition and also fired against fleeing Palestinians and fired, fired against the house of the Mukhtar. Now, why did I mention the house of the Mukhtar? Because months before the Dariusin massacre, the, the villagers in, Der, in Derisin, the village elders and the village Mukhtar, the village leader, they signed a non-aggression pact. What this non-aggression pact meant was, we will not attack you, you will not attack us, and that will be the end of that. Now, a member of the, a member of the Urgun came to the Haganah, and a Haganah leader by the, by the name of uh, Shel, Sheltil, this individual, told them, even though we don't want you to attack Dariusin right now, Dariusin is part of our long-term goal. It's part of our long-term objective because it, is a, it sits on a strategic hilltop. It is the corridor between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. So it is a core component of our ethnic cleansing oper operation. And the blueprint for this ethnic cleansing operation, the master plan for the takeover of historic Palestine was Plan D, Plan Delet. This plan was put together in March of, of 1948, and a month later, the Dariusin massacre was committed. Now, during the, uh, during the massacre, it's, it's important to note this because Haganah, the Haganah, the regular army, they want to absolve themselves of, of any blame, and they want to blame it on these, these underground groups, the Urgun and, and Lehi. But in fact, it was the Haganah that actually paved the way for the massacre to be committed in cold blood. If it were not for the Palmach's involvement, which is the elite fighting unit for the Haganah, if it was not for their involvement, the Urgun and Lehi would not have been able to go into the homes the way that they did and massacre men, women, children, old men. There are, there are, there are many stories, and I'm sure our brother Dahoud will get into a little bit more personal detail, but not only did, did you have murder in Deir Yassin, you had decapitation, you had disembowelment, you had mutilation, you had rape, not to mention looting. And all of this in the span of one day, at the end of so-called the, the resistance, the massacre that was committed in cold blood was committed obviously without any resistance. And near the end of that, of that massacre, prisoners were taken and they were put on trucks, and they were taken down Yaffa Road, and they were paraded as though it's a victory parade. And then most of them were mowed down with machine guns and murdered as a result of this brutal attack. 
55, uh, more than 55, but 55 known orphans were taken by a lady, uh, a wonderful sister by the name of Hind al Husseini. She took them in. She took them into her own home and she fed them. She um, cleaned them. She gave them company. And moreover, she, um, after, after a while, she, she actually took them into her own home. And while, while, while they were in her own home, she, she eventually established an orphanage and eventually established uh, an Arab children's school. Um, uh, daughter, daughter, daughter Tifim. So this, this still, this exists today. So her courageous work. These are the individuals that need to be remembered, because she risked her life, she risked her livelihood, she risked her money, she risked her, her time to make sure that these orphans were well fed and, and taken care of. So she was definitely a wonderful sister. I want to give a little, little bit more context on Darius Seen, if I may. Now. We need to understand the time period involved, right? May 15th, we commemorate that as Nekba Day. So that was the start. That was the climax. So you have, you've had a period of dispossession. Months prior to that, you've had phases of dispossession. The Nekba was the climax of that mass expulsion. We always point out that 700 to 800,000 Palestinians were dispossessed from their homes as a result of the Nekba. Not necessarily true, because over 300,000, some scholars put the number at 380,000. Approximately that amount were already expelled from their homes prior to May 15th, 1948, prior to the establishment of the, of the State of Israel. So this, this undercuts totally the Zionist narrative, which essentially says that it was the five surrounding Arab armies that came in and wanted to wipe Israel off the, off the map. Palestine was already being wiped off the map before any Arab invasion whatsoever. And the most formidable Arab army at that time, the, the, the Arab Legion from uh, Jordan, they only went to the part that was um, given to the so-called Arab state under the 1947 partition plan. So there was no suicidal attempt to wipe Jews off the map, but there was an attempt and there was a process in place to wipe Palestine off the map. Because even before May 1948, you had Dar Yassin, then you had Haifa, then you had Yaffa, then you had Safad, then you had Tiberias. You've had other villages and cities that were already captured and, and their residents already dispossessed before there was an Arab invasion in uh, May, May 15th, 19, 1948. I want to get to the numbers here because this is this also feeds into what the Zionist movement was trying to do before the climactic period of May 15th, 19, uh, 1948. What they did was this. They actually inflated the number. The Zionist press inflated the number to 250 dead instead of the what's on, what's on the objective record, which is approximately 100, maybe, maybe 110 people massacred. Now, why did they inflate the numbers? To cause the neighboring Palestinian villages and, and uh, cities to cause those residents to fear for their lives and flee as well. So it was an attempt to expel the Palestinians that resided in the surrounding villages and areas. So that was the point of maximizing those numbers. Now, we know a lot about Dariusin, but there, there, there's still a lot that is concealed in the Israeli archives. To this day, Israel still conceals the information, the, the photographs that were taken and actually, there was a petition to the high court in Israel to release those photos because under Israeli law, these uh, archives sh should be released after 50 years. Well, it's been over 70 years and they haven't been released. Israel, after that 50 year period, reclassifies them every single year because it will damage the international relations of the state. And the court specifically referred to the photos as being damaging. So what are they hiding? There's still more to this that we still need to uncover. And inshallah, our uh, brother Dahoud will give us a little bit more context on that. Um, I hope uh, we can engage in some meaningful Q&A if the time allows for it. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Tariq. Uh, if, you wanna, um, if you don't mind, uh, to, uh, can you see the questions on the side and, and see if you can answer a couple of questions and then we'll move on to uh, brother Dahoud.
Guys, if you are watching us, I just I want to remind you again, please share it with your friends and families to your groups so we can all learn about this massacre. Uh, we are up to uh, 70 viewers right now. So if you are, please just share it with your friends and family so we can all learn. Get up, Tariq. Were there, uh, I didn't see any questions. Were there any questions? Go to the comment section. Can you see it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, comments. Which yeah. You can... Yes. Um, I want to, I want to answer um, our sister, uh, Khatunide Sahuri's question about what do you mean that there was no resistance? There was, there, there was resistance. What I'm, what I, the, the point that I'm making is when uh, Palmach was involved, after after their involvement, they actually quelled the the resistance. There were there were actually reports stating that there were there was help coming from um, the neighboring area, Ain uh, Karim, and with uh, Palmach's involvement, they actually quelled that resistance. So there was resistance, but it was but it was not enough. It was not enough after the Palmach's involvement to stop the massacre that that later ensued. Did that answer the question, Khalto? And I want to respond to Wadi uh, Hasbeck's uh, statement. I don't think it was a question. There were approximately over 500 villages um, in uh, towns that were... Um, partially or totally ethnically cleansed um, throughout that period from 1947 up until 1949. And um, let me see if there's something else here. These are just statements, I think, except for Khatouni Das uh, comment. Correct. I see one. I don't know if you see that one from uh, uh, Fahid, Fahid Akar. Do you see that one? We want to invite him to Atlanta after. Oh, okay. I guess he's talking about Ahmed Dawood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now um, let's move to the, I guess, the, the start of the night. Uh, Ahmed Dawood Asad. Let's, uh, I'm sorry, guys, but I'm just trying to do two things at once. And Okay. Again, we remind you, April 18, we have our first fundraiser gala online with uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman. Actually, he's going to be joining us that night. So don't uh, please mark your calendar for that night. This is our uh, star of the night, uh, Brother Dawood Asad. Uh, he is uh, one of the Dar Yassin massacre survivors. At, at the age of 17, Brother Dawood awoke in early morning of April 9th, 1948, to his village in flames. After narrowly escaping, he made his way to the United States, earning a Master of Science in Industrial Management and Army Doctor degrees. In 2008, Brother Dawood released a book titled Palestine Rising, How I Survived the 1948 Dar Yassin Massacre. Since he has gone on tours and speaking engagement to educate the general American public about the massacre that occurred in Dar Yassin and other tra tragedies uh, faced, forced onto the Palestinian people as a result of Zionist oppressions. Today, Brother Dawood is a pillar in the New Jersey Muslim community, serving as a president of the Islamic Servant Service Organization. He was founding a, mem a member of the Islamic Society of Central New Jersey, located in Monmouth Junction, South Brun uh, I'm sorry, Brunswick, uh, New Jersey, and served on the board of the mosque for years. So with no, with no further ado, please help me welcome Brother Dawood Asad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. We can hear you, Brother Dawood. Can you hear me? We having some issue, brother Dawood. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, guys, it looks like we're having some uh, audio issues. We're going to fix that, inshallah. Just uh, uh, bear with us a moment until we fix the audio issue with the brother Dawood. And then we'll try to jump back to the questions. If anybody have a question until we fix the audio issue with uh, our, our uh, guest, inshallah. If anybody have a questions, please ask your question. So uh, our brother Tariq, uh, Tariq, if, uh, so he can answer uh, any question. If you have any other information you want to share with us, uh, we um, have. I can. I'm, I because because of the sake of time, I didn't want to get into uh, you know um, more detail. But I, but I guess I can provide a little bit more detail. I want to go, go uh, for it. I want to I want to emphasize a little bit more about the Urgun and Lehi. Now, in in Zionist discourse. There's always this talk about uh, what land was coveted and to what extent. These offshoots, the Urgun and Lehi or Stern Gang, they actually coveted the biblical notion of what they call Eretz Yisrael. This biblical concept of Israel is not just from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. It encompassed both banks of the River Jordan, the West Bank and the East Bank, which is now Jordan. But moreover, it extended from the Nile to the, to the Euphrates, not just from the river to the sea. So they, this stems from what is called Zionist revisionism, this revisionist brand of Zionism that calls for both banks of the Jordan, of the, both banks of the Jordan River. This was, the, the, the Urgun was founded by a man by the name of Zev Jabotinsky. This individual did not agree with the, with the mainstream Zionist idea of, of pragmatism to an extent. Now, the, the mainstream Zionist idea said, okay, you know what? We'll take less than both banks of the Jordan River and we'll incrementally get to that point. It's not that the mainstream Zionist movement did not covet that entire area. They did covet the same area. They were just a little bit um, less extremist in their approach. So they were not maximalists in terms of their position, but still Zionistic in orientation, which meant, which means three things. When we talk about Zionism and the Zionist enterprise and the Zionist objective, we are talking about three fundamental elements, which is the conquest of land, two, the ingathering of the Jewish exiles, bringing in as many Jews as possible into that area that you've just achieved through, that you've just taken through conquest. And three, and most importantly, the dispossession of the indigenous people of that land. Because what you want is an ethnic exclusivist state, a racial exclusivist, racial supremacist state. So Dariusin was the impetus. Dariusin set the stage, set the groundwork for the ultimate takeover of, of, uh, of historic Palestine. Because after Darius seen the, uh, the later phases of expulsion, all, hundreds of thousands flee. Over 100,000 flee between April and May after Darius seen. So you can see the effect that Darius seen had on neighboring areas and neighboring villages and cities. This is the crucial part of this. These groups, these two, Terrorist organizations, the Urgun and Lehi, they've committed terrorist acts before. Look this up yourself. The Count Folk Bernadette, Count Folk Bernadette was the UN mediator in the mid to late 19, 1940s. As the UN mediator, he said that Palestinians have the right to return to their homes. It is part of what he said, quote, elemental justice. He was assassinated by Yitzhak Shamir's Stern Gang. The King David Hotel bombings was committed by the Urgun against the British and Palestinians died there as a result as well. So we have to put it in context that this was a, these, these groups acted in a, ter in a terroristic fashion mainly, mainly to cause fear into the minds and hearts of the Palestinian people and cause them to, to leave their homes. Is Ahmed Dahoud back? Uh, we're going to try him. Yes, he is. Jazakallah khair, uh, Tariq, for that information. I know we, uh, I'm, I'm glad you have so much information to share with us. <laughs> to, to say Palestine, that. Palestine is rich in history, my brother. I know, man, I know. And, and uh, believe me, we don't know. We think we know a lot, but we don't. 
there's a lot of missing information. So let's let's try inshallah Amu Dawood now. Uh Amu Dawood, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes. Can you hear me, Ahmed Ahmed would say yes. Yeah, enough. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, so when do you want me to start? Go ahead. You go ahead, Ahmed Dawood. The floor is yours. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد first of all i want to thank the american muslim for palestine new jersey for really taking care of this problem and the remembering their yasin it's my village a beautiful village i was born there in december 23 1931 when the massacre took place i was only 17 years old and I watched most of it. But now, just give you just an idea about my village. Actually, in 1948, there were about 750 people. Of course, before it was less. And everybody knows each other. Everybody knows each other. Uh, it was supplied by wells, two springs and only wells. We have no electricity. Jerusalem had only th three small shops only and one telephone, three radios, and the radios were operated on by batteries, car batteries, we charged them every day. There was no electricity, one bakery oven only, and we have a Mukhtar elderly chief. Now, most of the inhabitants worked as messengers, truck drivers, and chefs, and cooks, uh, at the British headquarters in Jerusalem, and they mostly traveled in bicycles because we don't have any cars at that time, you know. Now, I don't, this is just a short, brief history about my village as far as it's concerned. Now, coming back to me here, my experience is on the night of 9 April 1948, I was with my six uncles over the roof of my, of, of my house. And then what happened in here about four o'clock in the morning, we saw truck, like trucks from, from uh, Ergonstein, the army, and the Stern, and, and the Haganah attacked us. They attacked us from all the places. See, our village is surrounded by three sides Jewish settlements, and the only side which you can escape to go to Ain Karim and Jerusalem is through the west side. So my house was exactly in the middle of my village and Giv'at Sha'ol, the first settlement. Now, what happened, we have two big quarries, Mahjara in Arabic, you know, big stone ditches, and we have a trench, we, we made a trench so that when the, if the trucks uh, come, uh, the Jewish, tr Jewish trucks come down here, we will hold them. So when the, when the tanks came, not tanks actually, they, they called them Safahat, you know. When they came and they start to go from underneath the, the trucks and, 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 and put the dirt in the trench in order to come to the village. But my six uncles, and we were the first spot, I mean, the first the, the first people to, to, to resist. They start to come from underneath and then and they put the, uh, the grounds to fill up the, the, the trench. And my uncle Salah, uh, Salih Rudwan, he, he was a, a good shooter there because he was in the Turkey army. So every time a man comes down from underneath, he, 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 he shoot at him. I myself, we have actually two old guns. One is, uh, they call it British, English, and one is Almani, Germany. And I was just putting the bullets for my uncles to, to fight because they attacked us from all the places. 
we had we fought about at least two and a half hours and we have only one brain only we we, we bought this from al alamein from egypt so after five minutes the the pipe or, or the we call it the, the barrel of this brain start to get hot and it's no good so anyhow we start fighting till we finish all our ammunition and then what happened in here we went downstairs i mean i i'm speaking about myself my uncle Rodwan and myself stayed outside and my uncles went down the house hoping to get ammunition again go up but they didn't come back so i went downstairs and i didn't find any uncles so i said to my uncle Rodwan, Rodwan, everybody's gone come come down so when he came down he was behind me he was so terrified that he could not walk so he went to my in my house was my grandmother and was 96 years of age Hajja amina and was my brother omar was two years of age there and myself and radwan so radwan stayed with my uh, my grandmother and this they were shooting too hard on us so i myself went down the stairs and then followed a trench with the period of the turkish people there we used to play when we were young play with it so i start to creep on my belly going from my home to the, the, the to the western side nearby the village because we are outside the, the village and and this trench will become shallow and my head i had a lot of hair at that time which goes up i see the bullets zoom zoom and my hair goes up then i go down then they, they, they were shooting to kill me then i was mad then what happened in here uh, through that trench when i was going all the way down to the west side in front of me i heard the noise and i was so terrified i couldn't even breathe because i thought they were jews but luckily they were my uncles took the same place so what happened in here when we were going to the downtown our house to the, to the west side the arabs who were in the west side in the top they thought that we are jews and they want to and they almost want to shoot us but amir saleh at that time he had hatta and akal you know the, the headdress and he took a branch from the tree and he started to, to shout to, the, to our to our people we are arabs we are arabs do not shoot do not shoot was okay but then we were the first the first hour we were really controlling and we were shooting real hard but what happened now they asked for help so the argo the, Hav the hagana is supposed to be a trained soldiers they came with two trucks and full of soldiers and they gave them some help and 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 then the battle turned against us i have lost 27 27 men from my relatives but my immediate family was my my old my old my grandmother she was 96 years of age and my brother omar and with, and with my sister six years of age they they wanted to leave the, our house to go to the village because my mother at that time was in the village was not with her because she was expecting to have a baby and she wanted to make sure that she goes there and have somebody take care of her in the in the uh, village inside you know but what so what happened in here when my grandmother was holding my omar my my brother over her head and my and holding my sister nazia in her head there was a, there was a lady who, who shot them and then they went my brother omar went down on the rock my now what happened is this before 
before my grandmother left the house, my uncle Rodwan was with her, and he was sleep, he, he slept, he went under the bed. So now when the Jews came in and he saw him, he told him to get up. They put him in the wall, and according to my sister Nazia, she was there, she, they, they shot, the first shot was on his head. And she said that he went down on the floor, and, and another lady put about six bullets in him. It was a terrifying thing. But then what happened, my brother Omar, he wanted some kind of a bread because of hungry in the morning. And my grandmother did not have a chance to go to the to the, to the uh, taboon, yani, oven to, to, uh, to make the bread. So she went inside to see where my mother is. That's when, in the middle of the way, that's when they, she was killed. So now my sister went and slept through my mother, my grandmother, and my baby. She did not. She was not. Shot, was not shot. But then, when the Haganah came and they started to take captives, they saw her moving. So they gave her small sugar and told her to go to the house where they have the other captives in one of the houses. So when my sister saw my mother, my mother said, "Naziha, what happened to your uh, brother Dahoud?" What happened to your uncles? What happened? What happened? What happened? She told him, I didn't see my brother the hood. I don't know what happened to him. But uh, Uncle Rodwan was shot in front of me. And then he says, where's your uh, grandmother? He says, if you want, I could show you where she was killed. So she asked the guard of the captives to take her, to take my mother, to see where my grandmother is or her mother and her baby, Omar. So it was good, she took her down there, and then when my mother took my brother Omar in her, in, in her hand, actually there was no bullets, nothing at all. Uh, it was a shot, but he was not talking. So we don't know what happened to him. Is that the shot from when he put his head all the way in the rock, or he is having coma, or he's alive, or he's dead? Up till now, we don't know. But my mother wanted to take him with her. So the, the guard told him, listen, if you don't put him in here, we have orders to shoot anybody who's going to take anyone who's dead. If you don't put him down on the floor, I will shoot you. So she was forced to put him in. And ever since that meeting, ever since that incident, incident my mother was so grieved. She says, why don't I take my baby with me and let him shoot me? That's much how that, that's much how he was she was mad and she was in misery. Anyhow, what happened then, they took the captives in in the truck and they went to Mahni Yehuda because see we were surrounded, as I said before, with three settlements. They give Asha all, we take care of him and, and Minahim, Minahim, Minahim. So what happened in here, they start to parade with them in Mahni Yehuda and the Jews spit on them, and then they took all their jewelry, they, went, they took the jewelry with them, and then they start, and, and they start to uh, spit on them, and then finally they took them to Jerusalem, where the, uh, I think Hindu Husseini ha has a house over there, and took him down there, the, the refugees. But now, here's, here's the problem. Luckily, my father, he was in a Majdal, nearby Gaza, with all my, with other brothers. If, they, if my brothers were there, see my mother have 12, we have, she has 12 boys and one girl. And just only in the village was myself and Omar and my sister Nazia and my grandmother. But my father was working in Majdal, nearby Gaza, in the road construction to finish a contract before the British move, moved. Because as you know, the British left May 15. But this was April, uh, for uh, April 9. So he has to finish the contract to get his money before the British leaves. So now what happened, they were there in Majdal, uh, the radio, listening to the radio at two o'clock in, in the afternoon about their Yassin. So my brother Yunus and my father, they were listening and, and, we, and they said that my mother and sister was among the killed. They mentioned my grandmother, they mentioned my relatives, and they were all shocked 
And my father said at that time, I have to go right away to the Jerusalem and see because my wife, I lost my wife, I lost my sons and so forth. So now, according to my father, he came in to Jerusalem and I want you to just picture the scene. Here's a scene where they put all the people who came from Darius scene inside the house. And if in that house, if anybody there, he's alive. If he's not there, he's not alive. So you could see the commotion in that house. Where is Fatma? Where is Maryam? Where is the hood? Where is no? Where is this? Where is that? Where we? And everybody was saying, oh, I saw this man killed in there. Oh, I saw this man, we didn't see him, and so forth. It was really a terrible, a terrible, a terrible scenery. But now, mind you, that we have a peace agreement actually with the Jews before not to attack. But you cannot trust them. Although they are not the Jewish from the settlements who, who attacked us from outside, but still they came from the settlements of Gifash Shaol and and, Minah, and uh, so they're surrounding us, but, but thanks God, we, the night before, we saw trucks moving in, in, the, in those settlements around us, because we can see them, so they're too far from us, okay? So we know something is happening. And then everybody took actually a spot, and then and they fought and fought till four o'clock in the afternoon, and the, and, and the village was surrendered, and, and this is just a small summary of the of the scenery. And this is my experience as far as I'm a survivor. But I always dream about it. I always, I, I always thanks God for 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 actually we are alive, you know. But ever since in there, we make we used to when I was in the United Nation working. We, we have every year we have the commemoration of Dir Yassin. And Dir Yassin will never be, will never be actually forgotten. Now, Dir Yassin, remember the reason, the importance of Dir Yassin, why did they attack Dir Yassin? They attacked Dir Yassin because number one is they thought or they think or they, it, they, they say that it is actually in a good strategic, strategic location because we could we could we used to go and and and, and uh, shoot on those caravans i'm all i mean to cut you off Tel Aviv to jerusalem and they take all the the, the wheat and the rice and all this from them and colony is the same thing and lift is the same thing so these i'm a Dawood. Vietnam, i'm sorry to cut you off if you can i think uh, your phone is slipping can you just uh place yourself in the middle of the screen for us you mean you want to hold up, hold up like this now? Yeah, if you can put it the way it was initially. Put it down and place yourself in the middle, inshallah. How, how is that? Can you see me perfect. now or okay? That's perfect. Uh, so what I'm saying to you here is actually, it's a horrible situation. And we were attacked from all the three sides. Okay? Now, you uh, uh, see, prior to that, about a month before that, they start to give us, they start to sent for us one time a cow to the village so that we could kill her and, and justify an attack. And But we, we were smart, we gave it back to them. But then one time they gave us a, a, an insane lady, she came here, she thought that we were going to kill her or maybe do something for her, but we took take her back. So they, it was a peaceful between us before with a peace agreement, verbal peace agreement, and in fact, in fact, when the Jewish came in the afternoon, they want to see where are those uh, people who were killed. Now, what happened, there was a French man called Rene. He wanted to come to you, to Darius scene to see what happened, but they will not let him come from the first day or second day, but the third day, because of the pressure, international pressure, he came down there he came down there and then he says, where are the dead? Nobody there. But the Jewish people from Kibash or he said, pointed to a well. They called Biri Josa well. They, they put all the dump, all the bodies over there. So this man took the cover of the well. There was no water in it. It's dry. 
and then he estimated that there were 250 people were killed. So when you say 250, all the papers say 250, uh, the Palestinian, Palestinian, uh, Jerusalem, Palestine say 150, and and the said 150, and and in the United Nations, the Arab there they said 250, and everybody was say 250. Every book you put 250. But to be frank with you, in my book, I had exactly 103 people they were killed. 100 from the village and three from outside. Who are the three from outside? The three from outside is one called a teacher called Hayat al Balbisi. She used to come from Jerusalem every day to Deir Yassin. She goes through the Ba'at Shaul uh, buses. And I used myself go and bring her from the bus to the village, to the school, and take her back. But at that night, there's supposed to be a wedding on Friday in Dar Zidane. And they asked her to come and stay in the village. So she stayed in the village. She could have escaped, but she did not escape because she went to the school. She got the, some small aid, first aid, and they start to, uh, to uh, actually uh, recover those people who are wounded. And they killed him. Although she had on her hand like a black thing that she is like a nurse or something, but still they killed her. Now, who are the other two other two people? The other two people were the bakery man and his son. And then, according to one witnesses, he went to that oven, and one of the Jews said to the Pharaoh, to the uh, he said he's from he's from Hebron. He says, "Put your son in the oven." And the and the son was so terrified that he said, "Father, please don't do it. Don't do it." And he held him his clothes. Don't do it. Don't do it. So, so he said, her father told him, I will go before you before I put him. So the man, the soldier, says, put him both, the father and the son, put them in the oven. Imagine, bake, bake them in the oven. This is according to a, a, a night witness. So now the reason this important the massacre of Deir is so important, of course, the other massacres took place before, you know, Ceramese and uh, King David Hotel and all that stuff, Gibia and all that. But the reason it is so important because of that village, the people start to be terrified and 750,000 refugees, they left their, their villages and towns outside in fear that this might happen to them as it happened in Deir Yassin. So this is just a short story and I'm willing to answer any question anybody has. Jazakallah khair, Ammu Dawood. We have really appreciate, we enjoyed listening to your story. Well, we can sit here all night and listening to you. Uh, now, I hope, I, hope, I, hope, I hope I was clear what I was saying. You were, you were very clear, mashallah alaik, mashallah alaik, Ammu. So let me, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm bringing in uh, our brother Wasim from New Jersey chapter to help us uh, with the Amu Dawood so he can ask uh, Amu Dawood the questions we have for him. Wasim, the mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah Wasim, speak up a little bit, please. Okay, uh, bismillah rahman rahim Amu Dawood, thank you so much for your time. Um, the one thing that we as the people in the United States working for the cause of Palestine, the liberation of Palestine, something that we miss is our connection to the actual history and the oral history that's so important so you're a gem in our movement and we benefit from you greatly and we appreciate you so much for being with us today um alhamdulillah we have a few questions queued up uh for you um we have uh one question by reverend fahid abu Ked from um, the galilee who now lives in atlanta georgia um he asks, what is... Uh, just day? wait, it's a, this, 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 that came from the other side. Just I think you should let it... Yeah, okay, go ahead. Make it, make it clear to me, please, okay? Okay. He asks, what is urgent and what do we need to do as Palestinian Americans in the United States right now? Well, to, to me here, I tell you frankly, every Palestinian, I, 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 I know that, he he will never 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 number one accept Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Never, even for the last man. Now what we need here, we are not going to watch Fox News 
and 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 the others. I think what we should do here, we always come together and commemorate these incidents. And I also like to see, for instance, if any attack on on a mosque or a church or a synagogue, I like to see the imam and the rabbi and a priest coming together on TV and condemn this action. Okay, we have we are living in this country. We should do good to other people, to our neighbors, invite them to our Ramadan uh, futur party. We should have be help them out so that we are here to stay in America and we should be one of the fabrics in America. And of course, we cannot we cannot actually forget our culture and our habits and so forth. But but we have to to, to tell the people the right thing and help them out so that they become to know us. You know, because many people, when they hear about Islam and Muslims, they were convinced because they have the propaganda is very, well, we have it now thanks to the internet. We have Al Jazeera now and we have other, other ones, but, but we should have more in the media, more lectures and keep this alive. Because you see, when I, when I went to Jerusalem, I was in Masjid Al-Aqsa and I, and when the people start to throw uh, bombs there, I was there. So what, so what happened is here, I told the people, look, listen, I speak, they speak about the Holocaust and so forth. Look at my village over there and nobody speak about it. And when you mention the whole, the Holocaust and from Darius said, the Jews get very, very frustrated. Hey, Dahoud, are you going to compare the Holocaust with your massacre of Darius here? I says, yes, to us, one is too many. Okay, so what I'm saying, we should get together and, 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 and be united and, and, and say we are not, we should not, should, should not be sure to say we are Muslims and tell the people about us and invite us and help them out. That's what I'm saying. Okay, Jazakallah khair. So I've, uh, in doing the research before having you on our live stream, um, uh, there was a tour that you went on a few years ago that I believe was uh, sponsored by American Muslims for Palestine. And it was a never again tour with people who I believe experienced the Holocaust firsthand. And you, as a Deir Yassin survivor, what is the importance of maintaining tragedies that have occurred previously to others, like the Jewish people in the Holocaust, and keeping it connected to the struggles that we see uh, as Palestinians, specifically Deir Yassin and other oppressive uh, uh, moments in Palestinian history and uh, oppression that people of other faiths, race, races, and ethnicities have seen? Well, you know, as I said before, Brother Wasim, you know, uh, I, I tell you, what, when I saw that, what it called, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, you know, I was there and I was speaking about my ma the massacre of Deir Yassin and I told them, look at this, it's only about two two kilometers away from here, in that place, a big massacre took place. This is my village, you know. But you know what? Uh, and we cannot even have like a monument there. And thanks God, I mean, we, we, we tried to put a monument in Jerusalem. They forgot, they did not allow us. But now there is one, I think in Geneva, New York, there's a fellow here, uh, uh, put in my book. He contributed one acre of land and he put a monument and he showed there he has seen there with a tree with broken branches and the people who contribute there and people go and visit it there. They will not put it on the street because of the zoning problem, but he had it in inside his field. I visit myself and took a picture there. Okay. So uh, they will not even allow us to put a monument for us. So but but you see the when you, whenever you mention there you see and the holocaust people start you know say okay we heard about their scene and some of the jews just to hug you and says well sorry what happened and so forth and a lot of people in my book in here since you know i put some people from jews who were condemning that massacre okay now i have a book about uh, palestine rising in arabic and english 
the, the English one, 5,000 copies went already because I put them in the libraries and I gave them to uh, overseas in uh, Jordanian libraries. They use them as a, so, as a resources in here. I put them in America here. But I have the Arabic ones, which is very, very good. And I'm, I, I didn't write this book for profit, but I will be, I will be more than happy to give free, just only two for the shipment, a book in Arabic. Now I have, and then if they want the English one, they could order it from Amazon or from other other libraries. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you now. But I have, uh, you know what, when, one time I took a delegation, uh, a delegation uh, and, and visited the Masjid al-Aqsa and Mufti of Palestine, and, uh, uh, Hussein, and uh, I took permission for them because they're not allow anybody to go like non-Muslim to the uh, Aqsa Mosque. But I know, the, I know the man, you know, and he allowed me to go, but what happened in there, we, I told the people, listen, we do not mind anybody come and pray in our mosque, but if you come for the intention of take it or divide it, like it happened in Hebron, we know, of course we're not going to let you in. And I explained this to the people themselves, and they were convinced. I spoke to them about the Isra and Mi'raj, how our Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, from where he prayed as an imam to all the people in Masjid al-Aqsa. I, I, I pointed him the spot over there. And I, told, I, I took them down to the Sahara, down there. And even they prayed behind me in a sunnah, two rak'ah sunnah, in downstairs in Masjid al-Aqsa. And I explained to him how our Prophet Muhammad, after his journey all the way from Mecca to Jerusalem, and he and, and, his, and he uh, prayed with all the imams, and he ascended to heaven from here. They were, they were very receptive, very receptive. And to just, just give you a story, I was in a bus there, the touring bus, a Jewish bus, and the guide over there, he said, he said to the people, oh, in partition, we agreed to, for the partition, but the Arabs would not, would not agree for it. So I raised my hand in the bus, I said, please tell him why didn't the Arab uh, uh, accept the partition? He, he did not answer me. He was about only 20, 22 years old. Then an old lady told him, the old man about me asked you a question, why didn't the Arab accept it? He said, I don't know. So I explained to them exactly what happened, why did we didn't accept the partition plan and so forth. So now we should be, all of us here, be like ambassadors uh, in, 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 in America and tell the people about our tragedies, uh, and put them in the, I mean, put maybe ads in the New York Times for commemoration of that. Uh, and now internet is there. So so we, we could do a lot of things, uh, Brother Rashid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you touched upon it as you were speaking, but I think that it's important for us to cover this specific aspect in relation to Darius scene in the history of the Palestinian struggle for liberation. Um, the Nakba from the early 20th century till today has been full of atrocities against the Palestinian people. Within its entire history, what is it about the Dead Yassin massacre that is so significant? Well, the most important significant is that it is a, a, a strategic place where number one, I mean, uh, we, when the Qastal, the day, the day before the massacre, there was a battle in Qastal where Abdul Qadir Husseini passed, uh, was killed there. Our people, we, they, uh, they participated in, in that battles, you know. And also before that, we used to, I mean, uh, Lifta and Colonia and Deresin and uh, El Karib, they, they used to go in the hills and they can cut the transportation and, and all those trucks which brings food from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it's only one main thing. So Shari al-Quds, you know, the big one from all the way from Jerusalem to uh, to Tel Aviv and to Haifa and Jaffa, you know. So they, they, they figured out this these places we have to take and the only thing we can take them is, is by having a massacre like there you see it. So they frightened the people and every, every, every town 
uh, start to leave, as I said before, you have 750,000 refugees left from left from the, uh, left their houses because of the Yassin. This is the important thing, you know. The the, the refugees, the, which which we were afraid, what what is going to happen to them, like our, like in our country, you know, in our village, you know. Um, um, Jazakallah khair, Amu Dawood. Can he hear me? Or if not, Wasim, could you ask him this one last question and we're going to wrap it up with Amu because we mm -hmm. are people, we're going to yeah. be up on an hour. Yeah. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. I, I really want to thank you very much. And, no, one second, Amu. One more question. Somebody asked, how many people of Dar Yassin survived the massacre? Do you know? How, how many what? How, how many, many people of Dar Yassin survived the massacre? No, how many people? How many people survived? Survived the massacre. Oh, well, I tell you, uh, there's 750 minus 103. So, the 103 survived or 103 were killed? That's about, yeah. But see, that, see we, I tell you what, what happened in here is we have the survivors. Uh, we, in fact, in my book, I, I put all the names of the survivors, their ages, and from what families they are. You know, so the ones that were survived in here is, is, is about, uh, I'd say, 550, 600 ma ma maximum. Jazakallah khair. Another question is, do you know what's in place of Dar Yassin right now? Which Israeli settlements there now? I'm sorry, say it again. Go ahead, Wasim, you want to ask him because he could probably can hear you better. The question is, what currently sits on the land of Dar Yassin? Okay, the land now they put in it. You know, I, I visited only one time. I was taken. I, I took permission from the minister of health over there to go there, and with the help of two mayors in Nasra, they allow me to go inside. And it has a big hospital for insane people. And they they always say if somebody wants to have their to go to their yeshiv, they say, oh. oh don't go there because it's, it's dangerous. Because there are some insane people; they will attack uh, attack them. And this is propaganda. No, when I was there, there was insane people there, but they were very quiet. They were not vicious. So, so now they they having it like uh, like a, a big hospital for the insane people. And also, I visited the school, the, the mosque. The mosque over there, when I went in, they have it like offices, the, the masjid and the school inside, inside my village. I, I said one to them, you know what? I said, you are, you are, this office is in the mosque. We used to, to pray here. He would not believe me, you know? And in fact, he had, there's a coffee shop. I have some kind of cacao, you know, cocoa from there. And I told the people over there, they came around me and they explained to him exactly who are in Dar Yassin. And, ha and happily, I thought there was somebody from Arabs who, uh, uh, who was taking care of it. And, and I'm not supposed to take a picture, but he told me, I, ha I have the mayors with me too, you know. So he told me, the man over there, he says, listen, don't let me see you taking pictures, but take a picture in here and don't, don't, don't let me see you because I have the problem. So uh, now, not, not too many people, I mean, I mean, I, I, I was allowed only about five to seven hours maximum to visit. And then I, I went. Jazakallah khair, Amu. Some houses are destroyed. Some houses are the way they end. In fact, I went, we had three houses over there. I was able to go there, uh, there, but one of them was uh, to my uncle's house. And it is to, uh, uh, used to have a balcony and an extra uh, uh, room, it was demolished. You know? Jazakallah khair, Amu. We, I, I personally want to thank you very much. You remind me of my grandfather, who used to tell me all the Palestinian stories all the time. I appreciate you. I want to encourage everybody to buy Amu's uh, book if you want to hear more from him. It's available on Amazon, correct? It's feeding now. Your book is available on Amazon, correct? That's what they told me. So, Palestine Rising by Dawood Asad. Look it up by on Amazon, and you can purchase it on Amazon to uh, to hear more from the Amu Dawood story. Thank you very much on your group here. 
for an American Muslim for, for Palestine, New Jersey, for taking the trouble to put this on. I appreciate this very, very much. We appreciate you. We did nothing compared to what you went through, Ammo. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Now, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to proceed with our event. Uh, we can sit here and listen to Ammo Dawood all night. Mashallah, Anu, he is, uh, he is um, yani, full of energy. Now I'm bringing back Tariq. And we are going to proceed with our, uh, to wrap up the night, and we're going to proceed with our event, inshallah. So now, next on our agenda for the night, inshallah. Let's see. Now, we're going to go through the campaigns we're going through right now. A little bit of Q&A. I think there was, a, there was a few questions that I wanted to answer. Okay. Really quickly. Go ahead. Yes, Q&A. Um, I think one of them was um, regarding the resistance, I believe. Is, okay. If there, the, 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 question was, the question was, if there were resistance at the time, then why did the Mukhtar sign a... Uh, the question says peace pact, but it was a but it was a non it was a non aggression pact. Even though they involved in uh, in any kind of violence, they still did not trust the uh, Zionist militias. So they still kept arms with them. So they were still armed, just to, just in case that the Zionists would violate the pact. And the Zionists, in fact, did violate the pact. If uh, if they did not keep arms, who knows? It could have been more than a hundred that were that ended up being uh, slaughtered if they did not show some kind of resistance. So that answers that question. And there was also um, I wanted to add to the answer about what now is in the uh, dairy dairy scene village. So it's uh, as he as our brother Amo Dawood mentioned, the Kafar Shul Mental Center is in the site of the dairy scene and also neighbor um, Jewish neighborhood. And also the um, Holocaust Museum is also within the site of the dairy scene. So you have, you have Jewish lives that are memorialized and you have Palestinians in the same soil whose names are unknown, whose tombs are non-existent and who will forever live in our hearts and in our minds. And it is absolutely crucial for us to understand that even with the minimal evidence that we have, without the evidence that's still concealed in the Israeli archives, even with the minimal evidence that we have, we know for certain that there was indeed a massacre in Darius King. And this massacre was committed by a brutal Zionist entity, which is a settler colonial enterprise. Now remember, and this, and this is something that we all know, but we need to emphasize time and time again. Jews and Palestinians lived in Palestine for centuries, and they were there together living in harmony. It is only because of the advent of Zionism. Zionism is what brought about the destruction of Palestine. Zionism is what brought about the enmity that now exists in that holy land. It is that ideology. It's not the people. It's not the Jewish people that brought that about. It's that racist, settler colonial ideology that is now manifesting itself within an apartheid structure. It is that entity that's causing the suffering of the Palestinian people. It is that entity that caused the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. It is that entity that we're fighting against today. Jazakallah khair, Tariq. Uh, do, are you, do you have any other question? Let me see if we have any other question. Anybody have any question? Let me take a look. Okay, Wally, Wally said how many were killed. I think Amo would answer that or not. I, I, I think. Yeah, I'll, yeah um, uh, actually, I'll add to that a little bit. So the numbers, the numbers are around 100 to 170, but I think the most accurate count is somewhere between 100 and 110. So the number that uh, Amo Dahoud gave, 103, I think, I think that's that's about accurate around that uh, around that number. But we have to remember that the Zionist press put the number at 250. They inflated the numbers more than twofold for the sole purpose of creating fear and causing fear to the surrounding villages and areas so that they will also flee and they can, they can capture the rest of that strategic territory and kick as many Palestinians out as possible. Because remember, I'll emphasize, I always emphasize this in every talk that I give. There are three fundamental goals of Zionism. One of them is conquest. The other one is the ingathering of Jewish exiles. And thirdly, and most importantly, it is the dispossession of the indigenous Palestinians. 
get as much land as possible with as few Palestinians as possible. That was the story of Darius Sin. That is the story that must be remembered, emphasized, and re-emphasized. Jazakallah khair, Tariq. Uh, let's see. I don't think we have any more questions. Do you have any more? Did you get any more questions? Anybody? Before we move on to the uh, next slides, inshallah. Okay. Uh, let's move to the next slides, inshallah. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about AMP campaigns, the current campaigns we are doing with AMP, the American Muslims of Palestine at the national, uh, national level and throughout the chapters, inshallah. So this, the first campaign we're going to talk about is the date boycott com campaign. So we got Ramadan coming soon, inshallah, and we need to emphasize this. So you need to check the labels. And Tariq is going to talk a little bit more about this campaign, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, we must 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 boycott boycott these brands you see them you see them right there we have a lot more information on our AMP website but these brands how they claim um Mahadran, Carmel Grexo, Agri, Agri Food these are the brands that we must stay away from these are the companies that we must stay away from because they are complicit these companies are complicit with the occupation and the oppression of the Palestinian people when people always ask what can what can we do we're, we're, we're here trying to, trying to make, a, make a living here. What can we do? This is something that you all can do. Just don't buy these products. It's that simple. There are many, many, many other Palestinian um, brands, Palestinian companies that you, can, that you can buy from. Just stay away from these labels and tell your family to stay away from these lab labels. Tell your friends. Don't just tell um, your uh, Muslim friends and family to stay away from these because there are a lot of non-Muslims that eat dates too during Ramadan and after Ramadan and before Ramadan. So tell everybody to stay away from these labels. We must boycott this Zionist enterprise. We must boycott the oppression of the Palestinian people. Stay away from these products. And we'll have a lot more information on our website and more to come, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. One quick question about this because we get this, uh, people ask us uh, this all the time. And most people, they just buy it. They don't care about the label. Uh, they tell you, okay, I'm just buying one box. What difference does it make? Can you give, I think Tahir gave us the, the difference uh, since this campaign started about two years ago. You know, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the same logic that comes with voting. Well, it's just one vote, a final vote, how, what difference is that going to make? But let's say, more, let's say more people have that same mindset. So if more people have that, have that same mindset and they apply that mindset, it's not just one person now. Now it's two, now it's three, now it's 30, it's 300, it's 3,000, and so on, so on and so forth. So it can have a ripple effect. One person can, can make a difference. So, and, and, and we all know it's not just one person. There are families that are buying this stuff. So we, we, have, to, we have to send the message across, across our communities wholesale. So I go into the supermarket, right? And you tell me, check the labels. I check the labels. There's two products. One says... West Bank, and one says California, but I'm not sure of the company on the from the West Bank. What what do you suggest? Okay, so if you look at the label and uh, and it says made, there are actually labels that say made in Palestine, but those are there those are still labels that you should they, that you should be wary of. It doesn't mean that it's not that it's not made in a settlement. It doesn't mean that it's still not Israeli dates. So the y yes, so if the products are unknown. Then, 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 then you have to do a little bit, a little more homework on that one. So those are those are the few tougher ones. But generally, overall, in ninety percent of the cases, the labels are going to be there. You you know which ones to stay away from. Just stay away from from those labels. If you see a label that says "Made in the West Bank" or "Made in" or "Made in Palestine," call us. Let us know. We'll give you the information on that. Zakalah khair. I know uh, you guys have been working so hard. There, there are actually uh, we have a. a a group dedicated for this just particular issue, doing uh, research and, and looking up the companies to make sure we are not uh, helping the settlements and we're not helping the occupation. Is that uh, I, I want to add. I want to add. There's a there's a few there's a there's a few suggestions on our AMP website of of uh, Palestinian owned products that you can buy from. So that you can just if if you want to shop quickly. Look for those labels and you can feel comfortable with them. So those are going to be on our website. So please check them out. So the, just to, to bring, I just got the information. We're going to talk about the difference in made. In, in four years, because of the boycott campaigns, the imports from uh, dates from Israel went down from 23 million pounds to seven pounds. 
So it's 23 million pounds to seven pounds. So it is making a difference. So guys, if you are, uh, you know, when you buy your dates, make sure you check the label, check the label guys. And, and like Tarek said, uh, go to our website. Uh, we have it on the screen in palestine.org uh, for more information on that. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slide, inshallah, to our next topic on uh, next campaign. Let's see. What do we have next now? Okay, remember in the Nakba series. Now, we have, uh, you guys, as, as most of you know, the Nakba is uh, May 15th, uh, and uh, that's the day we uh, remember the Nakba uh, every year. So we have a series going on from now to May 15th. If you guys notice our, our um, uh, different chapters, we'll be sharing different uh, facts about the Nakba. So uh, just look out for those, uh, like our pages, uh, whichever state you're in, and uh, just follow our pages to uh, get more facts about the Nakba, inshallah. And then we have another important date, which is the April 17th. April 17th is the Palestine Prisoners Day. So keep the Palestinian prisoners in your dua. That's the uh, Palestinian Prisoners Day, and uh, it's April 17th. Our next uh, date is the most important dates. Now, since uh, the COVID-19 started, uh, we have been, uh, just like everybody else, every other organization, uh, we are uh, doing everything uh, on uh, online, virtual, including our uh, fundraising now. So we are holding our first ever uh, fundraising gala uh, which is April 18th. We have uh, our guest speakers. We have different uh, uh, known guest speakers. We have Dr. Osama Bourshid and we have uh, our uh, Imam Omar Suleiman will join us that night. So please mark your calendars. It's going to be April 18th, 7 Central, uh, 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, we're going to leave you for Q&A for a couple of minutes. If anybody have any question about anything, about our organization, about our uh, the topics we covered, um, actually, I saw a question here. Do okay. you know? Do you know whether the dates available at Costco are from Israel? The the question, the answer to that, from what I saw, is yes. The dates in Costco are the Mahadran brand, uh, Mahadran company. So the most of the dates that are sold at Costco of that brand, Mahadran, M-E-H-A-D-R-I-N. Uh, there's a lot of them at Costco, so stay away from those. And I, I know a lot of Palestinians and Arab and Muslims shop at Costco. So stay away from that brand at Costco. It's, I think it's one of their biggest brands. Okay, the, another question. Do we have a chapter in Atlanta? I, I don't think, do we? Uh, I, I don't believe so. We don't have a chapter in Atlanta right now. We have, uh, so far we have chapters. We have um, uh, Bay Area in California. We have uh, North Carolina. We have Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have uh, Minnesota. We have New Jersey. Uh, we have uh, Chicago, of course. Uh, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we have, did I miss anybody? Uh, those are the chapters I can remember. You can check our website and we always, uh, we have the chapters listed on our website. Uh, anybody have any question? We're more than happy to answer you guys. Oh, uh, I see I see a question here. Uh, how about Starbucks? Okay. <laughs> I, get, I get that one all the time, look. Uh, I have I have a lot of uh, Palestinian friends that always tell me I should not buy from Starbucks. Starbucks is not part of the um, it's not a, a boycottable company, but I understand why some people because it's uh, actually I don't know why. There's this there's this perception that it's Zionist run, so but it is not it is not part of the official uh, boycott list. So that answers that. You can still go get your white chocolate mocha if you want. Oh man, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, let me see, connect us. If you, if you guys, oh, another thing, when you go to our website, let me share our website again with you. And you can sign up for our newsletter, you, uh, just our uh, email uh, list. So you'll receive up-to-date information. We always send out uh, emails uh, about these topics. So if you wanna sign up to our newsletter, uh, just go to our website and sign up for it. Uh, let's see, what do we have next? Again. I'm going to remind you again, I'm, I, you know, we cannot emphasize this enough. Please mark your calendars for April 18th, our online fundraising gala. And with that, Tariq, I think we should uh, be able to wrap it up if nobody has any questions. 
of those of those who survived the massacre how many are still alive today we answered that question right yeah yeah um it's approximately 600 uh it's a little bit over 100 were actually massacred and don't forget it wasn't just murder i i, I mentioned this once but I'll, I'll mention it again there was murder mutilation decapitation disembowelment rape and looting and and burning of bodies as well. I don't know. I don't know if I mentioned that part. There's also burning of bodies as well. Okay. I'll lay it humble. I mean, okay. So, uh, any anything else, Tariq, you need to say, or uh, I think we are uh, good to wrap it up. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. We are sorry about it last night, what happened last night. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us and uh, listening to our part of the story. Uh, please stay tuned, like our pages. We have different pages, different uh, chapter pages. We have our national page. You can like uh, any of other pages and we share the information on all the pages at the same time. Uh, it's me, Mu'ad Salama from St. Louis, uh, Missouri. That was host, uh, you know, I'm seeing for tonight. And we have our special guest uh, speaker, uh, Tariq uh, from Chicago. And we want to thank our Ammo uh, Dawood uh, Asad from the, the survivor, the star of the night. Uh, with that. Actually, Bob, before, before we go, one thing came, came to mind. Go to um, Google Dairy Scene Remembered. It's a website that's, that's dedicated to the remembrance of Dairy Scene. Get some more information on that. There's actually a memorial site in uh, Geneva, New York, I believe. And it was uh, it, it it opened up in 2003, I believe, this, the same day that the great Edward Said passed away. So there's some more information um, on the Darius Scene Rem Remembered website that you can get on that. Jazakum Allah Thank you, Tariq. Thank you, everybody. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.